It's a busy time of year here at Valley Ranch and one of the busiest guys on the complex, Mike McCord and his equipment team changing out lockers because there are some changing faces in that Cowboys locker room in 2009. Welcome to the Blitz here from Valley Ranch. Bill Jones along with the voice of the Cowboys, Brad Sham, who is also involved in college basketball. You know, March is known for March Madness, but uh, anymore it's becoming known in the NFL as being another form of March Madness oh. with what goes on the first part of the month. What could be more mad and maddening for fans, especially to try to keep track of and understand than the things that happen in the first couple of days. I mean, you see just from, from what was it, Friday night was at midnight, the first time that the floodgates could open, and here's Albert Hainsworth with $100 million, which isn't really going to be $100 million, <laughs> but never mind. It sure looks good for the agent. Yes, and it, yes, it does. <laughs> and then by the time we were just, we weren't even to the middle of this week, and we had Kurt Warner interviewing in San Francisco and taking a physical, and people are saying, well, how can that happen? Yeah, yeah, this is this is crazy stuff. It, it is, and uh, we want to get you uh, the very latest on what's going on uh, with the Cowboys. And let's uh, take a look at some of the comings and goings here at Valley Ranch. And, of course, the big story of the week, the T.O. story. After three seasons in Dallas, at midweek, the Cowboys make a decision on the future of Owens in Dallas. And that decision is that Owens does not have a future in Dallas. Yeah, Bill, that move caught some people by surprise, but I think clearly the Cowboys had been weighing their options on that. As the offseason progressed, I think you just have to look at all your resources, figure out how you're going to manage them, including Tony Romo and Roy Williams, the receiver, and uh, you, you figure out what the chemistry problems were and could they be fixed and all of those things. And so I think Terrell Owens probably will have another job sooner than later, but it's probably the best thing the Cowboys could do but it was a hard decision. So where does this leave the Cowboys at wide receiver? Well, it means Roy Williams is now the number one wide receiver with Patrick Creighton moving up a notch in the pecking order. And then there are a couple of restricted free agents that the team hopes to still have the services of. Miles Austin, who showed flashes of his big play ability this past season. And Sam Hurd, who, like Austin, has had injury problems in his three-year career here. But Roy Williams is now the number one guy here. Yeah, and I think that is, Bill, one of the real uh, parts of this that get overlooked because the Cowboys have a sizable financial investment going forward for several years in Roy Williams, and he is this year's number one draft choice. So I think you had to ask yourself as management, okay, are we going to be able to function at optimum level with both Roy Williams and Terrell Owens when that didn't become uh, something that they thought they could do? You've got Roy Williams, and I, I think with those other guys, plus the tight ends and the running backs, I think they'll be able to move the ball. Okay, from one Roy Williams to another, the UT Roy to the OU Roy. At the same time the Cowboys were deciding on T.O.'s future, they did the same with their five-time Pro Bowl safety. They first tested the trade market before deciding to release Roy Williams. I want to get your take on the Roy Williams time with the Cowboys. You know, I think, Bill, that it, it's really kind of mystifying and um, somewhat sad that in the very first full week of free agency, we would even be having conversations about the tenure of Roy Williams, the safety in Dallas. He was drafted with such high hopes and for two or three years, I would have to say that he produced. I would also have to say that after Darren Woodson was hurt in training camp, uh, I don't know that Roy Williams was ever quite the same player. Uh, and, and then I think that Roy's had a few injuries and some other things that have probably contributed to his play uh, decelerating and I, I know that when Roy said about a year ago in a radio interview that I heard driving down the turnpike uh, there were times that I was hoping the ball would not be thrown in my direction for a guy who you're counting on to be a difference maker that's an alarming statement I'm you sure you didn't drive off the road did you? I did not but I, <laughs> I did I my jaw did drop a little bit and I don't have any money invested in the guy so yeah I, I think that it's uh, I think that Roy Williams career in Dallas uh, uh, hasn't gotten to the place where Roy or the Cowboys would have liked it to go, and, and uh, that, that's too bad. So, as for the comings and goings, in the first week of free agency, in are a backup quarterback, John Kitna, and a veteran starting inside linebacker, Keith Brooking, who replaces Zach Thomas. 
and out the door this past week are starters T.O., Roy Williams, cornerback Anthony Henry, and defensive end Chris Canty, who's now a very rich New York Giant. And let's start by uh, discussing Chris Canty. You talk about big money being spent in free agency. How about six years, $42 million, more than $17 million guaranteed for Chris Canty as he is now a member of the rival New York Giants. I, I think, Bill, that Chris Canty had a sense in the middle of the year as his uh, representatives were starting to talk to the Cowboys and look at the landscape that it, there might be a problem getting him re-signed here. And frankly, and this is, this is how screwy all this stuff works, one of the reasons it might have been tough to re-sign Chris Canty is the deal the Cowboys gave Jay Ratliff not too long ago because the market goes up every year whether it should or not. And so you have this contract that Ratliff signs, makes himself a pro bowler, now, you can't then turn around and give a defensive end who has not accomplished on that level more money than your Pro Bowl nose tackle got. And, and I think the Cowboys kind of had an understanding, and certainly I, I can tell you personally that Chris Canty knew as early as about the middle of the season that there was a chance for economic reasons that this could happen. And so that's the kind of thing then if you're the Cowboys, then you sit back and you say, all right, we know we have Jason Hatcher and Stephen Bowen. And so if we don't have Canty and we do have Hatcher and Bowen and whatever else we can get, then how do we come out? How does it shake out? And I think they ask themselves the same question at the linebacker positions and in the secondary. That's how some of those decisions get made. And uh, speaking of the secondary, Anthony Henry, who's been a starter for the Cowboys, you know, several columnists in town were saying, well, how do you give up a starter for a backup quarterback in John Kitna? And I think probably the decision was made that Anthony Henry probably was not going to be a starter for the Cowboys in 2009. Plus, he was due a $1 million roster bonus. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, don't, don't misunderstand, Anthony Henry is a solid pro, and, and I think that he... He gave the Cowboys what they paid for when they signed him as a free agent. And would you like to have an Anthony Henry on your team? Absolutely. But let's not make any mistake. They didn't trade Mel Renfro. Uh, they, they traded a serviceable, somewhat older cornerback without great speed who might or might not have been on the team in 2009 and probably doubtful that he would have been in 2010. And in exchange, they got someone who they're pretty sure can give them some help at a position where they clearly desperately needed it, and that is backup quarterback. And by the way, before people say, well, wait, I thought they were going to move Anthony Henry to safety. What about all of that conversation? And, and I just think that's one of the greatest misnomers that was out there all season long. The conversations I had with members of the coaching staff indicated that was never really very close to happening. Well, you mentioned that uh, backup quarterback, John Kitna, a veteran in the league. And John Kitna talks about coming to the Dallas Cowboys. Well, I just think, you know, the first thing is, is an opportunity to be on a football team that is committed to trying to win a championship every single year. So you know, I'm really excited about that opportunity. And the ultimate thing for me would be to never have to play it down. You know, as I'm going through the playbook and, and different things, it's, you know, you just have a difference maker, a playmaker at every single position. And uh, I'm just really excited about it. I've never lived anywhere warm. So it's, uh, it's a dream come true, really. All right, and then on the defensive side, once again, Pierce Zach Thomas is out, the free agent, of course, and now Keith Brooking, who has become something of an Atlanta icon, is now headed to Dallas. Let's hear what Keith has to say. To have the opportunity to come to Dallas, where you know, there are a lot of reasons I chose Dallas, but um, you know, the main one was so I think they're prime and ready to make a Super Bowl run. Great opportunity there to do that, and then you know, secondly was. Just to, like I said before, to reunite with Wade, and you know, I think it's a great fit from that standpoint. Well, that gets you up to speed on some of the comings and goings here at Valley Ranch. We're just getting started here on the Blitz Trivia Time right now. What former Cowboy was MVP of the Blue Bonnet Bowl in 1960, the Orange Bowl in 1962, and he was the Cowboys' first overall pick in the 1963 NFL Draft? We'll have the answer for you later on the show. Plus, coming up, it's a Super Bowl 45 update. And Jerry Jones Jr. gives us a tour of the Cowboys' new stadium in Arlington. Plus, it's a trip to the Dallas Cowboys cheerleader calendar shoot that you don't want to miss. The Blitz continues in a moment. The Blitz is brought to you by Pepsi. 
Pepsi is the official soft drink of the Dallas Cowboys and the NFL. And by Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster is the official ticket exchange of the NFL. Visit DallasCowboys.com slash ticket exchange to buy and sell tickets today. NFL has announced, it's the first time in the history of Super Bowls, they've announced um, that the AFC champions will be in Fort Worth. They'll be headquartered here, and uh, all the NFC champions will be headquartered in Dallas. And uh, Mayor Bob Clark, the stadium will be in Arlington. Uh, <laughs> And welcome back to the Blitz. Bill Jones along with Brad Sham. And yes, Roger Staubach is involved in the Super Bowl 45 preparations as the game will be played in Arlington, as is Troy Aikman, as is so many others. And it takes so many others to put on an event of this uh, magnitude. But we do find out a little bit more. And I think we're going to be finding out bits and pieces as we go along here exactly what the roles are for the specific cities with this event. And I, I think one thing we found out is that uh, there, there's a role to play in terms of locale and exposure for Fort Worth, for a lot of places in Dallas County. And the main thing we found out is that this is uh, an event that's going to really in, encompass a couple of years. There are going to be a lot of events, uh, celebrations, concerts, and parties, and things that are going to put a big spotlight on the whole area for a much greater period of time than just one football Sunday in February a couple years down the road. And of course that is uh, one of the landmark events, the landmark event for the new stadium in Arlington less than two years away. But let's check in on how construction is going on the new stadium and the man giving us the tour this week is Jerry Jones Jr. along with Dia Wall. Any and everything Dallas Cowboys is truly a family affair. Jerry Jones Jr. oversees the suites and clubs and took some time to share with us some things that put them on a much higher level. But well, we're in the Silver Club here, which actually uh, it'll be the American Airlines Club, and then on the other side it'll be the Sony Club. We built club seats all the way from row one going all the way up to basically row 45. So we really want the experience in and around the game itself. So it's really built for people watching when there's not a play going on. Right. So we really focused on that hard to create an experience that would be like no other that you'd see in any other venues around. Hopefully, I think our fans will find out when they get here they're gonna have an experience like no other. Something uniquely Cowboys. Uniquely Cowboys, absolutely. There are more than 200,000 square feet of club space in the new stadium, and the same Bigger in Texas approach applies to the suites. Not only is each suite at least 25 feet deeper than those at Texas Stadium, but the glass is 100% retractable from the highest suites to the suites at field level. We built uh, what we call sideline suites, and the reason they're called sideline suites is they're actually right at field level, and the way we designed it, you can sit there and see the coaches talking to the players, and you're in the game, you're on the sideline. We built portals, so they go right from their suite and take a stairwell literally right from their suite up, and their tickets are the first two rows, and they're on top of their suite. Kind of the best of both worlds. And so world. you're getting a seat in the stands to sit there and have your hot dog and get the mustard on your blue jeans, or you can go down and have a suite experience and then also have a sideline experience. When you think Dallas Cowboys, you think of it being first class, you think of doing everything the best and doing it the right way, and so hopefully that's what we've done here. Today, you're getting so close to doing unveiling of the actual stadium itself, so I can tell you it'll be a very emotional moment when you actually have an event in here and see uh, this place full with Cowboy fans. It won't be long now. For The Blitz, I'm Dia Wall. Wow. That stadium is already fantastic and it isn't even open for business yet. By the way, Jerry Jones Jr., once again this year, a member of Sports Business Journal's 4040 Club, one of the top 40 sports executives in the nation under the age of 40. So congratulations to Jerry Jones Jr. Speaking of that stadium and that magnificent video board being installed at the stadium, it spans between the 20 yard lines on the field, features four screens, totaling more than 25,000 square feet. 
HD video capability, of course. Upcoming events at the new stadium, well, that George Strait concert alongside Reba McIntyre sold out in about one hour. It's set for June 6th, the opening event, and then the first college football game will be played Labor Day weekend, Oklahoma, BYU. The Aggies and the Razorbacks start their series there on October 3rd. The Big 12 championship game will be played in early December. Just a few of the events already on the schedule this year for the new stadium in Arlington. Very much to come here on the Blitz. Who's back at Valley Ranch? We answer that question. Plus, we'll take a look at that Dallas Cowboys cheerleader calendar shoot in the Bahamas when we come back.